yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, my name's uh, Robin Lawrence. I'm uh, an agile coach, uh, safe program consultant, and a professional scrum master. And I'm based here in the UK. Um, I've been working with Akaditi for some time, and I also work with um, uh, Bradtac. So I work in the agile space, um, but I also have um, uh, a background in biological science. So today um, we're going to have um, a discussion about agile technology and the future of work. It's a really broad um, uh, subject area and um, we hope to do it uh, some credit, but we're going to, um, uh, we're going to have a, a, a session that, that has a little bit of um, interaction as well. And I can't actually see any of you, so feedback's a little tough. So um, Annabelle, um, uh, we're, we're gonna need to do an exercise. Um, and, and I don't know, are you able to um, uh, allow people to um, uh, unmute themselves? Can you unmute everybody? Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, so I need to unmute people for the exercise, okay? And just have a, a, a normal meet and greet and say hello and get some feedback. Okay, so tell me when everybody's unmuted, um, Annabelle. Okay, sure. Are we unmuted? Yes, everyone is unmuted. Everybody's unmuted. Good afternoon, everybody. Can I get some feedback? Say hello. Hello, good afternoon. <clears throat> excellent excellent there's human life i'm just staring at a screen which is not great <laughs> okay good good to know that there's life out there okay so um i gave the introduction to uh, our discussion this afternoon uh we're looking at um agile technology and and uh you know the future of work but first um i want to look at a little piece of human technology before we get into things and we've got a little exercise to do. So I'm gonna need some help from you guys. I'm gonna need a little bit of feedback. Uh, and what we're gonna do is just take a, a, a short amount of time. We're gonna stop what we're doing and we're gonna breathe. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna do some deep breathing and then we're gonna hold our breath followed by some breath restraint. I'm just gonna tee this up on my, um, on my phone so that we can um, uh, time it. Now it's a really, really simple exercise. Everybody can do this. We're going to take 11, 11, one, one, deep breaths. On the 11th breath, we'll exhale and we'll hold our breath for as long as we can. Is that clear to everybody? Yes, yeah, it's clear. Yeah, give me some feedback. <laughs> okay, good. So I'll just show you, um, I'm just going to do two breaths to show you the breaths. And then I'll show you the ex to exhale and then hold it. So you can just breathe in, breathe out, in, out. And then when it comes to the 11th one, you're going to do this, breathe out and hold it. Has everybody got that? Yes. <clears throat> Excellent. So I'm going to count three in. Three, two, one. In. Hold it.
Okay. All right. Has everybody done that? Give us some feedback, guys. Yeah, yeah, we did. Bye. To the best of our abilities. Okay, good, good. Okay, so I'm just going to call on a couple of people. Tell us how you felt before and how you felt afterwards. Anybody, just shout out. Calm down. I feel relaxed now. Feel relaxed? Does yeah. anybody agree with that? Yeah, sure. Does anybody feel more excited, ready to jump around? Feel more well, I, I, I will say yes to that, Robin. Okay. Well, everybody's different. So that's, it's, there's no right and wrong answer here. Okay. But everybody experienced something. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Very true. You'll see the significance of this little experiment as we go through our discussion. And, um, you know, once you get to realize my um, scientific tendencies, perhaps you'll forgive me. Maybe you won't. Who knows? Let's see how it goes. Okay. So the ideas that we want to um, have a look at and, and uh, discuss mm -hmm. around are laid out there for you. So we want to have a look at artificial intelligence, how that's going to impact uh, the world of work. We want to have a look at what drives a lot of uh, uh, artificial intelligence programs, namely algorithms. We want to consider consciousness. We want to have a look at bio-integrated technology. You know, people talk about wearable technology. We can talk about wearable technology. We can talk about implantable technology. And um, we, we also want to consider the, 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 the future of work. Um, but I want to do that through the lens of looking at the purpose um, of work. We're going to also uh, have a strong focus on human technology. And I'm going to get some of your ideas um, on that. And we're going to look at some of the work that is going on at some of the top institutions in the world to try and understand organizational culture, because this is something anybody who's um, an agile coach or a scrum master out there will know. This is incredibly difficult to change behavior in organizations and understand the behaviors that we see. There's some groundbreaking work going on um, in, in, in that field. And we don't really have time to go too deep in it, but I just want to take the lid off of it, have a look in to pique your, your interest. So that's going to be mastering human interactions. And then at the end of all of this, um, you know, it's got to be verifiable to you um, because if you can't verify it, you can't know whether it's, it's, it's a reasonable or valid thing to do, a relevant thing to do for you. Okay, so those are the, the areas. We're gonna try and navigate um, uh, through them. And uh, I think I'm just getting some messages. Um, no, I know, that's not, 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 not relevant to this. So uh, let's, let, let's move on. So let's have a look at a definition of technology. Now, if you look up technology, you see something like this. So the application of scientific knowledge for practical purposes, and it, it's, it's applied to industry, to work. But it can be applied to many, many other things. And we're going to have a look at that in, in a moment. But typically, you would be looking at application of knowledge to systems, to equipment, and uh, to processes in order to gain a specific desired output. Um, this is a very specific, narrow um, uh, definition of technology. And I want to see if we can expand that a little bit more. So um, this every time you see uh, the jigsaw puzzle um, with the green piece with the gap missing in the person's head, I'm going to need you to think a little bit more creatively and, 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 and exponentially. The crazier the thought, the better. 
I'm going to come back to that notion at the end with, 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 a, with a, a true story, something that I experienced. So what is technology? Well, how I would explain it, I would say that it is the ways and means. It's the how. It, they're, they're the skills you possess in order to get things done, whether you're talking about a process, whether you're talking about investigation. And a key component in technology is feedback. Okay, I think somebody, could somebody mute, mute that? You mute yourself. I'm getting some noise, yeah. So, let's have a look at this, uh, the, the, this image here on, on the screen. As I said, um, yeah, my background is in biological science. So a lot of my references um, hark back to biology because I still love it quite a lot. So over on, your, uh, over on the right-hand side of the screen, there is a larvae. Now this is a, a planktonic larvae. So it's found in the sea, it's a marine larvae. And this is the marine larvae of um, a flatworm. Um, and those of you who did biology will remember your flatworms, platyhelminthes. So this, um, this larvae has some incredible technology. It's absolutely staggering. You can see these, um, uh, what look like legs shooting out of, of the side. Well, th these actually allow this larvae to alter its depth in the sea and it it has at the top a large photoreceptor. So it alters its position in the, in, in the, in the seawater based on the amount of light that is coming through. This is an application of biologic technology. We're gonna see this again and compare it with our real world situation in a, in a more obvious way. But what I'm trying to say here is we need to think very broadly about what technology actually is, because this organism is achieving something quite incredible that would take us years to try to um, replicate. Now, some, some systems are in existence. We've got photoreceptors, which, which are uh, linked up to printed circuit boards and, and are integrated and can perform functions that this thing does it all by itself. So it's just to understand how broad the application of technology actually is. This takes us into another space, another big idea that we want to look at. And we're gonna be looking at a number of big ideas um, uh, around this technology space. Um, we, we mentioned AI earlier on, and I wanted to uh, just peel the lid off of consciousness. Um, this is a huge, huge subject. Um, but if we're talking about the future of work, if we're talking about um, uh, the human interface with um, machines, consciousness is always around the corner in the discussion. So here we're defining consciousness in quite a narrow way again, um, as just as being the, a state of being aware and responsive to things around you. So when we say responsive, we're introducing another big idea that is going to, you're gonna see as a theme through this conversation. And that is that if you are responsive to your surroundings, you are interacting. And interaction is going to be a, a big theme uh, that, that we continue with. And we'll see um, when we actually just stop and pause for a moment and look we've got this image of the brain we've got this printed circuit and what we're representing here is what we call an interface and an interface is a place where two systems they could be it could be a, a an organic system it could be an inorganic system it could be a human it could be a machine it could be two different organizations it is a point where they meet and interactions occur. So one of the key characteristics of an interface is that it must be in balance to allow the interactions to occur. So how does all of this feed into agile and how does this all feed into um, how we work? Well, let's develop the ideas first and then we're gonna go into it. So 
we've just spoken about the interface and we've spoken about this idea of balance. Now I want to get you to think about this. Um, whether you're a biologist or not, this matters to you. As an organism, as an air breathing organism, consuming oxygen, we all produce our energy by this top equation here, cellular respiration. So we've got glucose and oxygen making carbon dioxide and water. Carbon dioxide and water are the waste products of cellular respiration, but they are the base raw materials of photosynthesis. So in the animal kingdom, we consume carbohydrates as fuel for our energy. In the plant kingdom, the plants consume carbon dioxide and water along with the input of sunlight to create the fuel that we consume. This is an interface which needs to remain in balance for all cellular organisms on the planet to survive. So that is how important balance and an interface is. And this is the reason why we've got um, uh, the Paris Climate Accord, um, because we realize that things are going a little bit awry in, on this planet in terms of uh, the pollution that we're creating. This is the reason why. Because if we upset this in a way that we can't reverse, we've got a problem. When we look at um, biological uh, systems, these interactions, particularly in multicellular organisms, which is what we are, work down neural networks. And again, I just want to introduce the idea that this neural network is the place where the interactions occur. And if we're talking about artificial intelligence and interfacing with machines, it's going to make sense to really understand our neural networks. And I've got to tell you, there's a lot of work that needs to be done still. We still really don't know that much about them. But down a neural network, the, the kind of interactions that one can experience are things such as nerve impulses, phone calls, emails, sound waves, speech. Um, and this is occurring in what we would call a complex adaptive system, an organism, you or me, in other words. So on the left here, we've got the components of artificial intelligence. Notice the network on the right. Um, we've got an Android um, with uh, uh, an image of a, a, a network of interactions, but machines are capable currently all of these properties, um, vision, autonomous vehicles, Google has done a huge amount on autonomous vehicles as have um, Tesla, robotics and um, NLP. So the networks are the frameworks through which these interactions um, uh, travel down and are communicated and transmitted. So here we go again, back to work. And it's often said about the work-life balance. Um, well, I'm really more concerned with the word balance here. We've spoken about balance um, at uh, the interface and the importance of balance being at the interface to support um, uh, the interactions. And getting back to work and how these things impact work, uh, if we look for example, at an area that I was in. Um, on the left here, you can see a robot, top left. And on the right, you can see what is an artificial hip. Now, I'm just gonna throw this out. Uh, I mean, we probably won't have, uh, I think everybody's muted, but I'd like you to just think, how old do you think that robot is, how old do you think that artificial hip is? Well, I'll tell you, because you, you're all muted. <laughs> if this was an audience, it'd be so much more fun. Um, 
So the robot on the left is called Robodoc, and that was designed in the late 1980s. The artificial hip on the right is called the S-ROM. It was designed by a Russian orthopedic surgeon. And that was designed in the 1970s. So um, that's going on um, sort of 50 odd, 50 odd years. Um, and what I would ask is, is the technology that is being used here obsolete? So the reason why I spent a bit of time talking about um, human technology is that this device on the right hand side, the hip, if you look closely, you can see little steps at the top. There's a sleeve at the top. That sleeve is what we call porous coated. Porous coating is, on, on an orthopedic implant is, is metal which has incorporated in it the, the same biological constituents of bone. And the reason for that is to allow the bone to grow onto the um, implant, in other words, to integrate. So this technology is bang up to date. It's been around for 70, 80 years, but it's bang up to date. And it's bang up to date because the human side is fixing it. So that's just something that we need to consider when we're looking at this uh, human machine interface, the limitations that we have as, as, as the human beings. So we said we'd look at some, some, some biologic um, uh, technology and we'd uh, bring in the concept of algorithms. So when I say the word algorithm, I'm, I, I mean in a narrow sense, simply a set of instructions. You know, developers write code, which, which are instructions to perform um, a, a task, to execute something. Algorithms are simply a set of instructions. So we've got two builders here. We've got a bricklayer at the top, and we've got a spider at the bottom. And the bricklayer may have gone to college or he might have learned his trade from his family, but he would have learned that. He wasn't born and capable of doing that. Spider, on the other hand, another builder, is able to construct a web immediately. There's an algorithm, a code within their DNA, which enables them to create proteins, build their own bodies, build the silk that's required to build the web, and to give them the know-how of how to spin it. So again, when we're looking at the future of work, we've got to consider natural systems. That's what we've got to do. We've got to consider natural systems in order for us to understand them so that we can create stable um, interfaces. So finally, we get to Agile, and we can go back to the start of um, uh, our conversation. And that was, I asked you to do this exercise, this breathing exercise. Um, a little bit of human technology, um, as I called it. How does that play into work and the future of where work goes? Well, at the moment, in an, in an agile way of, of, of working, um, we plan the work that we want to do, we do it, we inspect it and we adjust. So in Scrum, we have this inspection, um, uh, adaptation, and we make it transparent. So we have this scrum theory. Um, this is taken from uh, Scaled Agile, which really is uh, extracting the same, the, the PDCA cycle. So you plan something, which is uh, a cerebral activity, which is a thought process, and then you execute it, which is a physical task. You then inspect what you've done. You analyze what you've done which is another um, uh, thought process. And then you make an adjustment. That adjustment is a result of learning. And learning is central in agile ways of working. And one of the things that we find with 
work of the future, we're basically moving into the information age. Well, we're not moving into it, we're in it. And in that information age, learning, continuous learning is fundamentally required. And if we look at the big ideas why, we have to understand systems. We have to understand our own human system. And I would suggest that we need to understand our own human system very well before we start interfacing with machines. Otherwise we might get Arnie's Terminator as a result. So the balance that is achieved through understanding the two um, systems at the interface allows stability of the um, interactions and therefore the efficiency of any transactional activity to occur. And we see this straight away in um, agile ways of working. And, that, and then you know, this agile has been, um, I suppose, around for centuries, but has probably only been instituted and codified by words for the past sort of 20, 22, 23 uh, years or so. But one of the things, whoops, that I really do like about um, Agile, and I had some, um, had some questions um, here for you, is how Agile goes into nature, pulls and abstracts things out of nature and applies them. So when we're looking at um, uh, work in the future, we're looking at these complex adaptive systems, we're looking at AI, we're looking at deep learning, we're looking at the interface, the human machine interface. We have to understand the human interface very well. And in the agile ways of working, agile does this. So we have this thing in nature called the golden ratio. And uh, I was going to ask you, but you're all muted. Actually, could you unmute everybody? Let's, um, let's make this a little bit more interactive. Hello, are we unmuted? Hi. Yes, are we unmuted people? Are we unmuted? Annabelle, could you unmute everybody? They, they all have the ability to unmute okay. themselves. All right, okay, I'm gonna ask some questions, guys. Okay, guys, okay, so this symbol is called phi. On the left, the big one is uh, uppercase. On the right, the, the smaller one is lowercase. Let's have a look at this number sequence. Can anybody tell me the name of that number sequence? Shout out. Hmm. What's the name of the number sequence? Who's come across this? Fibonacci sequence. Exactly, perfect. So if you look at that sequence, you can see a pattern. If you add the two, Two previous numbers, you get the next number. Yeah? Can you see the pattern? Yeah. Um. Good. Okay. So, what is X? Who can tell me what X? What number is X? 89. 89. Exactly. Okay. And where is this used in the Agile world? I guess it's not used, right? Because when it is so big, then this means there's a lot of uncertainty, ambiguity that need to be clarified. Yeah, yeah no, but yes, that, that, that for, for large stuff, yes. But when it, where is this sequence used? What, what, to a, what process? To assign to points. Estimate. Yeah. Get. To assign yeah. points for the purpose of? Story points. Estimate. Yes, story measure, points. measure your speed of the spring. Okay, so for measurements and one other word beginning with E. Estimation. Estimation. An estimation is an attempt to do what? It's just an attempt to try and predict what's gonna happen, right? Yeah. Okay, so the beautiful thing about this number sequence, why it's called the um, the golden ratio is that it can be observed absolutely everywhere. So 
the big idea here that I'm trying to, trying to suggest is that if we are observant of nature, of which we are a part, we can take this into the future of work. And I think this is a very, very strong theme. Um, okay. We spoke about predictability. This um, uh, is some of the things that we currently do now. So we, you know, we spoke about story points, we spoke, we spoke about estimation, and in the agile world, we're trying to work iteratively, we're trying to deliver value quickly, and when we work in sprints or iterations, we, we estimate how much we can get done in a fixed period of time. And we can measure this. And the reason why we can measure this is because we can actually observe what happened. So we forecast what we think it is, and then we observe what actually happened. So in other words, we can create what we call a say-do ratio. This is what we say we think it is, and this is what it actually turned out to be. If you observe that, remember, that it's about being observant. So if you observe that in hey. SAFE, we have um, a program increment, which could be five, okay. five sprints or uh, five iterations in length, so to up to 10 weeks. If you observe this carefully, meticulously over that period, you get to learn very clearly what a team can or can't do. Now, this, was, this is one of the teams that um, I'm working with. So you can see um, on, on the left here, 4.1 to 4.4 are the iterations. And on the left, and this is what we say we were going to do. So we said we were going to do 51, and then we actually did um, uh, uh, 24. So we had a, a, a steady ratio of, of 47%. Not great, but at least we know we've got a basis to improve. And you can see that it's... It, increases progressively as the team realizes they're trying to you know take on too much work and they reduce the amount of work they take on um, in line with what they can actually do this is what it informs of um, this is a, a slide which looks at you know the impact that this is scaled agile uh, has had and this comes from cases from scaled agile um, from the scaled agile framework and what they found in terms of engagement of teams. Could somebody mute themselves? I'm getting a bit of background. Thank you. Um, so 30% of um, employees are happier because they're more engaged. Products get to market 50% quicker. Um, there's a lower level of de defects and um, uh, raised productivity. These, of course, are are arguable, but what you're trying to do is create permissive conditions for faster times to market, delivering value quickly, happier motivated people, more productivity and higher quality. If we take this a step further, and uh, this is really an area I feel that um, if you're um, in the youthful phase of your life, is really going to be massive over the next 10 years. And this is the area of social physics. And this, the father of uh, social physics, sorry, there's a typo there. It actually be Pentland, P-E-N-T, not Petland, Pentland. The father of social physics, so sorry, um, father of social physics, um, Alex Pentland um, has, has written a book. I've got the book there and I will, um, leave the sides um, with um, the guys at Akaditi. And what this guy is doing is nothing short of staggering. He's, he's a sort of 70 year old professor at MIT. And what they are doing is they are studying these interactions in these networks. And they mo their model comes from cellular biology, from nature, and they are modeling these interactions and taking them into real world scenarios. And what they're looking at is the interactions and collecting data on the interactions to represent and predict how things are going to flow. 
So this is a huge area, and this really gets under the skin of looking at what culture is, how it can be unpicked, predicting who's going to leave the organization, who's, who's happy, who's productive. This will give us all of these great um, uh, insights and um, will allow us, anybody who's done an agile transformation knows that when the when the um, uh, when the when the um, agile folk leave, um, uh, the so so does the transformation. So these are the tools which will really allow us to embed in in the behaviour of people in the future, so that we can achieve some of those projected figures that uh, that, that, that that working in agile ways can deliver to organisations. So um, yes, I certainly recommend this. And um, this is actually um, an example of um, uh, uh, my, my current client um, using um, some of the, uh, this um, uh, social physics to look at how they can move customers from their current state to a future state, employing the insights that interactions give through automation and through integration, looking at what's obsolete, looking at what's um, cutting edge, looking at how users migrate and move from different systems and utilize different uh, areas of the services. So these are the ways that we are looking at predicting the future um, currently. And some of this is coming into organizations as of now. We're actually using this um, as of now. And, and the quote is um, uh, uh, the, at the bottom. I think this is Abraham Lincoln. Uh, somebody needs to mute again. And, and th this quote, I, 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 I like it and I don't like it because um, it, it, it's, it's um, yeah, it can be, I think it probably can be a bit pejorative, I suppose, but it is true in that <clears throat> the best way to predict the future is to create it. Well, we're certainly um, in that phase um, and in that mode. And speaking of the future, we're wrapping up um, so that we can have some um, questions um, and, and um, a Q&A session at the end. I, well, I was going to say questions and answers, but I can't guarantee I can answer anything really. Um, I, I'm a sort of fan of, of, of Star Trek. And um, uh, those of you who know uh, Star Trek will, will, will know that, um, uh, that, that there are two sort of huge organizations in, in Star Trek um, and Starfleet is, is, is one of them. And Starfleet has, Starfleet is a command and it has officers. And, um, you know, I, I often wonder, you know, what is Starfleet's objective? Um, you know, the, the claim is, is for exploration to boldly go but a lot of the times they're policing and the rest of the time they're engaged in war. Um, you know, why else would they be a command? So, you know, the reason why I bring this up is because there is an, an amazing idea that Gene Rodenbury came up with relating to the future of work. And, 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 and that ties in with the, the higher organization uh, uh, that Starfleet is actually a subset of, which is the United um, Federation of Planets. And, and here, the, 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 the big idea, the purpose of work is that, you know, people are not working for money, um, you know, sort of a thousand years um, into the future. They are working to acquire knowledge so that it can be applied. And um, if you read um, Michio Kaku's um, uh, famous book, um, The Physics of the Impossible, um, you will know that there's this Kardashev scale of uh, uh, planetary civilization. And the United Federation of Planets is, is a type one, which means that it is able to manage the energy of a planet totally and completely. And once you can do that, you are freed from the drudgery of, of having to work for money. It's no longer a concern. So ultimately, um, you know, my hope, my dream is that the 
future uh, of work can tend towards something like this. So I'll just end with a, a little true story. Um, so I worked in science and I worked for Johnson & Johnson and I was um, the marketing manager for orthopedics. But before I got that position, I was uh, a field sales rep and I worked in operating theatres. And they asked us one time to come up with three products. And it was like a, it was like a you know, ask the, ask the reps to get the idea from the field. And they asked us to come up with three products for hemostasis. And I was selling quite a lot of these hemostatic products. And there were three categories. There was um, what we call Me Too, so a straight copy of what's out there, competition, to fill, to fill that market segment. There's incremental, something that was better than the competition, marginally, to have a competitive advantage. And then something that was transformational. And I submitted three ideas, and four of the reps for the whole country got selected to go up and present to um, uh, the marketing board and the R&D board. Well, you know, uh, me with my head in the clouds um, had seen uh, some surgery being done um, in a hospital using an ultrasonic scalpel, which vibrates, um, you know, uh, about 55,000 cycles a second. Where's this going? So I presented these three products, but my transformational product was a little bit on the Star Trek side. What was it? It was a molecular scalpel. Why? Because I thought if you could uncouple vessels, blood vessels at a molecular level, if you could open them and close them using enzymes and laser, you'd, you'd, be, able to, you'd be able to have bloodless surgery, just like in Star Trek. So I presented this and it was one of the most humiliating experiences of my life. I got laughed at. So in those days, we had what we called OHP, overhead projectors, and, and, and the slides were written out by hand. And at the end, I was packing away my, my slides and the director of R&D came up to me with a big file. He opened the file and he looked, he pointed to a document. He said, look, someone has already patented a molecular scalpel. 1973, I believe it was. Why do I say this? I say this because it is these crazy notions which stretch the possibilities in the world of work and where that trajectory of work can go. So the crazier the idea, trust and believe somebody else has already had it. So with that, I'd like to thank you for indulging me. I'd like to thank you for your time and happy critical thinking. We can take some questions. I think we've got, yes, 15 minutes. Thank you, Robin. Right. Thank you so much. This was indeed very insightful. Um, if you have any contribution or questions, you can use the Q&A session or you can unmute yourself and ask him any question you have or contribution. Any questions? Okay, so I think there's no question. Okay. For you. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure having you. I've got a couple of questions. Okay, okay. Are there any agile coaches in the audience? Guys, please, you can speak up. Have we got any Agile coaches, any Scrum Masters? Are there any written questions? Because I can't see any written questions on Annabelle. 
There are no questions. Okay. I must have stunned everybody into silence, given them too much to think about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank okay. you, Robin. Okay, bye everybody. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you. Thank you guys. All and right. Please join us tomorrow at 12 p.m. for another thrilling session. Okay. I okay. think someone has it. Okay, okay. Oh, somebody has a question. Okay, yeah, fire away. Nana Yao, do you have a question? Um, no, no. It was just a response to um, what oh, you were okay. telling. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you guys for coming. Okay. Bye. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Bye. Bye. You there, Annabelle? Yes, please. Yeah. How many people did we have? 29. 29, okay. Yes, hmm. Okay. And are they, are they mainly from Ghana? Um, so you, I don't really see you know, where people are coming from and stuff. Okay, most are from Ghana. Okay, all right, that's good. That's good. But not all, most okay. of them. All right. Well, next time round, um, I'll definitely. I'm just so busy be in the run up to this, but next time round, we'll definitely. Um, uh, um, I'll, I will um, uh, do some do some publicity down this end. Would love that. Okay. Thank you. All right then. Take care. Bye bye. You too. Bye. We know we will get there.